if you're not rejoicing out over after that, I don't know what it'll take. Appreciate the children's choir this morning, two songs, and uh, doing such a just a wonderful job and such a blessing to us this morning. In one of the songs that the children sang and in one of the songs that the congregation sang this morning, they were singing and we were singing a Hebrew word. Do you know which word that was? Hallelujah. Or hallelujah. Actually, the Hebrew word would begin with an H, but um, that's the Hebrew word. Hallelujah. And then Yah is Jehovah. And so you were singing it today. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 146. This is the first of the last five Psalms in the book of Psalms, our hymnal, our biblical hymnal. And these are sometimes called the Hallelujah Psalms. And that's because they begin and oftentimes end with the words, praise the Lord, which is really the one word, Hallelujah. Actually, two words. Hallelujah. And then the Yah. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 146 today. I felt just that uh, with the Thanksgiving time coming up, it was, I believe it's important to take the opportunity to thank God and to praise Him. And this psalm is really centered around praise and the reasons why we should praise Him. In in Scripture, thanksgiving and praise are virtually synonymous. They might have a little bit of a different uh, angle from them, but they really are even used as substitutes for the other word. They're found often in the same context or passage. And although every person alive on the earth today has a reason to thank God, they should thank God. We as believers have a greater reason to thank God. We have much to thank Him for this morning. That's one of the reasons we're here today as the body of Christ because praise is the way we worship God and show our gratefulness to Him and to His Son who came and died for us. For a Christian, praise should come as naturally as breathing or eating. And I think oftentimes we as believers feel that way. We, maybe we get to thinking about something or maybe we read something in our devotions or we hear something that makes us just almost spontaneously say, Lord, thank you, praise your name. That can happen several times in one day. And we need, even though we set aside this time for Thanksgiving, we really need to thank the Lord all year long, don't we? Because of what He has done. I'd like to read this psalm first, and then we'll begin our study of it. So if you'll follow along with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. However, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. 
who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we would echo what the psalmist here has written. Lord, may we find in this psalm great encouragement. May it deepen our trust and our faith in our God. And Lord, may it cause praise to bubble up within us as we think about all you have done and all you are doing. Lord, we have much to thank you for. And maybe, may today be a day where we meditate and consider all that we do have to thank you for. Help me, Lord, as I would preach this text. May you uncover, Lord, gems of truth that will encourage us and cause us to humbly bow our heads and praise you and thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you look at this first phrase, praise the Lord, what it really is is simply a, an, an, almost an ejaculation of, of emotion, of praise. And that's why it begins with this. And I, this is an exclamation the exclamation of praising God. And notice that he says for it is, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. And he indicates here that our entire life should be filled with spontaneous interjections of praise to God. Praise the Lord would be, it would be kind of similar, and I don't mean to cheapen it at all, but it would be kind of similar to saying, awesome. It, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a natural response to something that somebody says or something we're thinking about. And that is what this term, praise the Lord, means. They are short, emotional interjections to something that we have heard or thought about. As I mentioned, praise the Lord in Scripture is kind of a, a melting of, together of two words, hallel, and then for, they add the, the U, hallelujah, and yah is the Hebrew word for Jehovah. It's kind of a shortened version of it, but that's what it is. And we have many hymns that use that word. We sang one this morning. The children's choir sang one also. We sung Hallelujah, What a Savior. Revive Us Again uses the Hallelujah. Our Great Savior uses that. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. And it's there because it, it personifies, it, it uh, communicates the thought of praise to God. This word praise means to shine, to make a show or to boast, to rave about, to be clamorously foolish, which in English means to make a fool of yourself. Really, it, it, it means that for God, we make a fool of ourselves. All of those definitions that I gave you really are straight from the Greek concordance. To shine. Now there were, there were a few of the children this morning that were literally shining. <laughs> they showed the joy of the Lord on their faces. 
Sometimes they do better than we do as adults. But we should be unashamed in our praise to God. We should be unashamed of saying amen to truth, to God's word, to what God has done for us. And if we worry about what others think when we sing or when we say amen or when we give a testimony, we are not really praising God. We are proving that people are more important to us than God is. That's really the bottom line. Our entire life should be filled with praise the Lord. Our whole being should be employed whenever we praise God. Notice he says, while I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. You know, it is good that we praise the Lord while we're, while we're still alive, when we have a tongue to praise him. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The psalmist here is commanding his soul to praise the Lord. He's commanding his soul to shine, to boast in the Lord, to rave about God. That's what we're, we're doing. We never know who's going to be in our services. We don't know if it'll be an unsaved visitor. And that's why our, our praise ought to be genuinely raving about God. It's worthy. He is worthy of that. Soul here represents your mental, emotional, and physical being. We're to engage every faculty of our being to praise our Creator and Savior while it is still possible. That's what the Bible means when it says in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. See, that's, that's putting our whole being into loving Him. And that's what the Lord desires, and that's what He is worthy of. And that ought to be just spontaneous from us. Exodus 15.2 says, The Lord is my strength and song. And our, our music expresses words of praise to the Lord. Strength and song suggest emotional language. Do you know where this, that verse is found? Exodus 15.2. This was the song of Moses that was sung by the Israelites after they crossed through the Red Sea. And they were able to watch the water come back and deluge the armies of the Egyptians. Do you think after that that these people were a little bit pumped? <laughs> Do you think they had a hard time going to bed or going to sleep that night after all that had happened? I'm sure that was still, uh, the adrenaline was still running in their veins. But it was more than that. The Lord had done great things for them. And they could praise him. I'm sure they talked about that incident for weeks and months and years. I wonder, have you ever been so overwhelmed by something that you you read in, Bible, in the Bible or, or something that the Lord has really blessed you with that you just, thank you, Lord. I've said that several times when I was almost in an accident. Thank you, Lord. Do you think God is glorified by half-hearted, mindless, weak praise. He's not. He wants our whole being to be in it. Whether it's at home, when we're having family time together, or whether it's in our prayer closet as we're worshiping God, or whether it is here at church, our praises should engage every part of our being. 
when we consider all that he's done. But not only that, our trusting praise should include the past, present, and future. And the reason why I say that is because the Hebrew language here in verse 2, where he says, while I live, or I will sing. While I live, I will praise. That the, the phrase, I will praise, and the phrase, I will sing, both of those indicate continuous action that begins in the past. That means that no matter what has happened to you in your past or in your present, you are to be able to thank God and praise Him. And we know that that is consistent with all of Scripture. We are commanded to be thankful in all things. We are commanded to be anxious for nothing. We are commanded to cast our care upon Him because He cares for us. And even if we don't see all the reasons for it, we are to praise God in faith that there was a purpose for it that is for our good and his glory. See, it's our unbelief which shows itself in our attitude and contributes to our prayerlessness or our lack of vision or our lack of faith or our wrong choices in life. It's unbelief that causes bitterness towards God. It's unbelief. See, you can't be bitter towards a person without being bitter towards God. Oftentimes we think of, well, I'm not bitter towards God, I'm a bitter towards this person. But God is the one who allowed that. And we can't really be bitter at, at just that person. We're all so bitter at God. Because if we, weren't, if we were not bitter at God, then we would be trusting God. We would have faith in God. We would believe in his purposes that they are best. And when we fail to trust God regarding our past, our song will be very weak hearted. Thankful hearts are praising hearts because they believe in God. Unthankful hearts can't praise because they have accepted the lie of Satan to doubt God's wisdom and goodness. In these next verses, the scripture, the psalmist gives us the secret to praising God. And there's really two secrets. The first one, notice he says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. So the first secret to praising God is don't put your trust in people. Don't put your trust in man because man will let you down. Friends, we, we even know in our, in our families, we disappoint one another, don't we? We, we let each other down and, and we get angry when we shouldn't or... We treat someone with insensitivity or we say something we shouldn't have said. And so we, we realize that we really can't trust man. We have to trust somebody else and that's God. And he says, do not put your trust in princes, what does he mean by that? I believe he's talking about men of position or people. This could be men or women, but it's saying, uh, don't put your trust in people of position or rank or importance or personality or talent. And that doesn't mean we should never respect anybody, but it means that ultimately our trust is in God, that if that person lets me down that I, I respect highly, I'm, it's not going to devastate my life because my trust is in God and I realize that every man is weak. 
Every human being is sinful. That's why we can't trust man. We can't put our trust in man. We should first turn to the Lord for help and direction. We, we should be seeking God all the time. We should be prayerfully seeking God for His will in our life. And we should never disobey God's word in order to follow a man. So that's the first secret. Don't put all your hope in man because he'll disappoint you and you'll fall then. But the second secret is obvious. Let me just first mention verse 4. He says, His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. He's saying he's, he's made of dust. He's going to pass away. And his plans will perish. That's why we don't trust in man, because man can't really guarantee anything, can he? Because we don't know what the next day will bring. There might have been somebody on 9-11 who worked in the Trade Center and promised his son that he would be back to play ball with him that day. And he never came home. But friend, when God makes a promise to you, He keeps His promise. Because He can always follow through on it. And that's why here He says, don't put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. They're not the ones who really have what it takes to help you. It is God. And so put your trust in God and your praise will be strong. Put your trust in man and your praise will be weak. Always look to God for help first. As I mentioned before, always be true to God's word. See, Ishmael was the product of trusting man. Ishmael was the product of not going to God for counsel. It was evident because they didn't ask God about having a child through Hagar. Always remember that man can never deliver you from trouble like God can. Depending on man, always has lasting consequences. There's a snare to trap you. We talked about this last Wednesday night to some degree. Whenever we use our own carnal reasoning rather than walking by faith in God, there are consequences to that. Difficult consequences. It carries a high price tag. Depending on Man's carnal reasoning will weaken and destroy generational godliness. Whenever we put our trust in man instead of God, it carries a price tag. Turn over to Malachi 2. We've heard... from the st statistics that are given to us today that the divorce rate among Christians is as high as it is among unbelievers. That is incredible. And when that happens, what it does is it weakens the generations to come because it tells them that our God is not great enough to heal a marriage. Notice what it says here in chapter 2, verse 14. God is speaking, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. 
yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. I use this as an example just to say that when we, when we violate God's commands, there are, there are consequences, there's a ripple effect as a result of that. I realize that some people, as in any other area of life, some people divorce because they're forced to or they, they aren't the one who initiate that. But what we need to see as believers, I've, I've known of, of believers who have just gotten out of their marriage because they just didn't like it, professing Christians. See, depending on man's carnal reasoning will weaken and destroy generational godliness. The influence of making a carnal decision like that will be passed down to other generations. Asa was called a good king who trusted God when the Ethiopians outnumbered his army two to one. But 15 years later, when he was threatened by the king of Israel, he trusted in man then, and he turned to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and he asked him to come up and help him. And he sent part of his own treasury and part of the treasury of the house of God to Ben-Hadad as a payoff, and he came, and it worked. But God sent Micaiah, or Hanani, I'm sorry, to come and visit Asa after all of it took place and warned him. And he said, the, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for that one person who will trust him, trust God. And rather than going to God again, he trusted in a Syrian king, a Syrian army. He made an alliance with a heathen that he was not supposed to do. Well, what were the consequences of that? Do you remember whose son, who his son was? His son was Jehoshaphat. Another king that's called a good king. But Jehoshaphat also made bad alliances. In fact, he made an alliance with the next king of Israel, which was wicked Ahab. And when you, well, he gave his son in marriage to Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, and when you marry into Ahab's family, you also marry into Jezebel's family. But one day, Ahab sent for Jehoshaphat to come and meet with him. And he came, and while he was there, he sought Jehoshaphat's help to go against the Syrians again in battle. And Jehoshaphat asked if well, the false prophets that Ahab sought all said, go, go into battle, you'll win the victory. And Jehoshaphat said, isn't there at least one prophet of God that we could look to for counsel? And he said, well, there is one man, his name is Micaiah, but he never tells me what I want to hear. And so, but he sent for Micaiah and the captain went to get him, and on the way, the captain was telling him, now just tell them what they want to hear, okay? And so he gets there, and he kind of mockingly says, go on up. Everything will be good. And then Ahab realizes he's just mocking, and he says, tell us, 
tell us the truth now. And he says, I see the armies of Israel and Judah just dead bodies laying all over the mountainside. Now, what was interesting about that incident, in fact, I think the most interesting and the most the sad, the most sad part of it was the fact that Jehoshaphat wanted this prophet. He wanted to hear from this prophet. But what did Jehoshaphat do? He allied himself with Ahab and he went right out to war with him. He did not even give he didn't follow the prophet. Jehoshaphat refused to trust God's word, and that influenced his son Jehoram, who was the who had married Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. And he took it much further. He it says of him that he walked in the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. All because he made alliances, all because Asa, three gen or two generations earlier, made alliances. And it broke down the generational godliness that could have been there had Asa been true to the Lord. And friends, all of us have made carnal choices in our lives. But whenever we do that, there are consequences for it. And we need to turn to God, not man. We need to fear God, not fear what men might do. We need to follow men who follow God. We shouldn't follow men because we like their personality or because of their talent or because they entertain us or tend to stroke our ego or anything else. We need to follow God. We should love those who love and fear God and, as the Bible says, who tremble at his word. Follow those who make you look small and make God look big. Follow those who don't put you in awe of themselves but leave you in awe of God. Those are the people to follow. When first meeting Jesus Christ, Peter worshipped him. Do you remember what happened? The Lord wanted to use his boat as kind of a stage for preaching. But then after he got done with his preaching, he said, Peter, you go out into the deeper water and throw in your nets. And he said, but Lord, we've been out fishing all night. Don't you know this is my profession I know what I'm talking about. But he could tell on the Lord's face that it wasn't, he wasn't getting through. So he finally said, okay, I'll go. And he went out and they threw their nets in the water and they couldn't draw it in because it was so big. But they hadn't caught anything that night. And what you do is you find Peter literally up to his knees in fish, kneeling before God, before Jesus Christ, and saying, depart from me, I am a sinner. Now, friends, that was genuine worship. But go a little bit later, three years, and they're in the upper room, and they're having that last supper, and the Lord is telling them what's going to happen. And, and Peter says this, Peter, though all deny you, I will never deny you. Now, friend, that was not true worship. That was self-worship. And even when the Lord had reproved him before, he didn't take it. He didn't hear it. Now, I'm not being hard on Peter because Peter represents all of us. Is our worship true worship? 
or is it feigned worship? Is it, is it really trusting in us? Now, it sounded good, but what it really showed is that he would never deny Christ. He's too strong. He's too courageous. It sounded spiritual, but he was really worshiping Peter. You know, Ruth is a refreshing example of true worship and praising the Lord. And she was a Moabite. She found herself in Israel and she was there because she chose to follow the God of Naomi. And she didn't go back to her own people. That would have been a huge trust factor for her. She left her own people. She left her own God for the God of Israel. And she was deeply thankful for Boaz's undeserved kindness in watching out for her in the fields, watching out for her welfare. She showed her virtue. She showed her trust by simply doing the most menial things. She showed her trust in God by honoring her mother-in-law, even though she was bitter. She showed her faith in God by honoring her counsel when Naomi said, let me share with you what you need to do, and she did it. And Boaz said, everyone knows that you are a virtuous woman. See, we, nev we should never doubt that God would keep his word. We should always hope in God. See, in, in Psalm 147, just on the next page, in verse 11, it says, The Lord takes, takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that God takes pleasure when you put your hope in his mercy? He does. Ruth was happy she followed Naomi back to the land of Israel. She was happy because you know the end of the story as she held her child from Boaz in her arms. Now you go back a generation, and do you remember who Boaz was? Who was Boaz's mother? Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. But because she trusted in God, the Lord had pleasure and mercy on her. My friend, this is true for anybody. There's no partiality with God as long as we are willing to follow him and trust him. I know of some people who think, well, I, I'll never be anybody because I didn't grow up in a, in a good family. I didn't grow up with a, a mom and both a mom and a dad or saved parents. And, and there, were, there were a lot of things that happened. Do you know that if that's the case with you, you are exactly who the Lord is talking about. You're a prime candidate for rearing a godly family if you trust in God, if you look to Him. See, God, God wants you. He puts out these things to help you to trust, to give, to give you hope. Satan wants to destroy your hope, and he, he wants you to think according to carnal reason. Well, I didn't grow up in a good home, so therefore I can't have a good home. That's not true. If you go back far enough in somebody's generations, you'll find that all of us came from bad roots. Right? In fact, the Bible says 
God is a father to the fatherless and to the widow. If you will follow his word and look to him, you can be a godly mom or dad and raise a godly heritage. It's happened many times. Psalm 112. I'd, I'd like you to keep your finger here and just turn quickly to Psalm 112. Look at verse 1. What words does it start out with? Let's say it together. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And listen to what it says. And we ought to say amen to this. Blessed is the man, and that, that could be a woman as well. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. And here's the result. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. That's hope, isn't it? He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Notice the first verse doesn't say, blessed is the man who grew up in a, in a good home. No, it says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. He can be the first one who has, starts a good home. His descendants will be mighty on the earth if he trusts God. Don't forget about Asa. Asa was a believer. He was a good king overall. But he made a very bad choice which affected the generations to come because he failed to trust God. As I mentioned, God is not a respecter of persons and he will bless anyone who follows and trusts in him. It's, I don't want to make it a legal, legalistic thing like you have to, it's following God. It's just spending your life pleasing God and that means we pay attention to his word. We hope in him. What's interesting to me is that the emphasis of Scripture and the emphasis of this psalm is to give hope to the needy, not to the strong, but to the needy, to those taken advantage of or those who are pressed, those who didn't have a father or a mother. He's, it, it doesn't mean that the principles don't apply to the other people as well. But it's like he's, he's putting it in this language so everybody knows there's hope. If you didn't have all the advantages that somebody else had, that's all the more reason to confidently trust in God and to put your trust, your hope in him. Now look at the reasons that he gives for trusting. First of all, let me get back to my passage here. He says, happy is he, verse 5, who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord. That is the, that's the second secret that we've already talked about. And now look at what it says. Why are we to, to do this? Why are we to put our trust in God? Well, he made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. He's the creator of heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, all life. Creation 
that we see is, is one of the first reasons we ought to trust God. Creation is a big deal to God because more than anything else, it has His signature all over it. When Job was complaining to God and wanted his day in court, when that day in court finally came, what did God use to humble him? What were the first words to Job? from the Lord yes listen to some of the words I'm taking a few snatches here and there but he said then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge now prepare yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth tell me if you have understanding who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? He's talking about the, the stars, the constellations. Can you bring out the constellation in its season? Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? And he goes on for, for like three chapters talks about all the creatures, many of the creatures that he created. And at the end of it, Job is humbled. He's, he says, he, he repents in ashes and he says, I, 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 basically he says, I'm stupid. I didn't know what I was thinking. In chapter 40 of Isaiah, God is comforting unbelieving Israel. And he's assuring them that, all, that although he will severely punish them, he will keep his covenant with them. And he says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And then he goes on saying this, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And he, he's talking about Israel. I'll bring you back. I'll lead you back to the land of Israel. And this is how he reassures them. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measure heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Who has weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in, balance, in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing. <laughs> That's why we're not supposed to trust in princes. He makes the judges of the earth useless. And then he ends that chapter by saying this. They who wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. He's saying, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And you will end up praising him. If you trust me, I will help you. If you will hope in me, I will, I will help you. 
No wonder Satan wants to silence the voice of creation through evolution. If God can do all that, can't you and I trust him with our lives, with our souls, with the decisions of our life? Can't we trust his principles if his wisdom did all that? He, next it says he is, he is the truth and is the keeper of truth. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. He guards it. He protects it. God cannot lie. God's truth will always be truth. It's never outdated. He's always the same today, yesterday, and forever. God's word has never changed on preaching the gospel. God's word has never changed. It's still the inspired word of God. God's word has never changed on marriage. It's still a man and a woman. God's word has never changed on child rearing. He tells us what to do. It's never changed on finances, on the Lord's day, on the sovereignty of God. It's never changed on gender. God's word has never changed on how to live by faith, on defining love. God's word has never changed on how to know him. And we could go on and on and on. God's word doesn't change. He's never lied to us. His truth is, is real truth. And he will honor his word if you will follow his word. Notice he executes justice for the needy. I'm going to combine all of these together as one because basically he's saying the same thing. He talks about the oppressed, the hungry, the prisoner in bondage, the, the blind physically or spiritually, the humble or broken or bowed down, the one who has been just kicked and beaten, the stranger, the alien, the lost, the fatherless and widow. All of these, I, I could give you what he says, you know, the, the person in bondage, he will set free. In fact, this really is the parallel of Matthew 11, verses 25 through 30, where he says, Come unto me, all ye who are late, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Old Testament version of that is... In Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, and it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Listen to what Isaiah 57, 15 says. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Friends, that's what he says to us. He's here to help the needy, whatever the need is. And when we go to him for that help, we will praise his name. But notice in verse 9, the last phrase, he says, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. Now it's interesting that he says that because often we think 
We look out and we see the wicked prospering, don't we? But he says the end will be that the Lord will turn them upside down. He will destroy them. It's just like the Israelites as they were watching the waters come in on the Egyptians and That's the end of the wicked. That's the outcome of the wicked. And we obviously have to see this in light of eternity. Because God doesn't always right the wrongs here, does he? Much of it will be in history, but when, but when we are standing around the throne as we've learned in Revelation, we will see what God will do. Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the high priest. Do you remember Jehoiada was the priest who took Joash when he was just a small child? And when Athaliah the wife of Jehoram, who was the son of Jehoshaphat. When Athaliah murdered all of her grandchildren, Joash was the only one that was salvaged, that he, he was saved by Zechariah's wife. who is actually the, the sister of the one of the uh, king who had perished. And what happened, Jehoiada then hid him in the temple until he was seven years old. And then he brought him out after he had counseled with the guards. And they crowned him king. And Athaliah didn't know about it. And when she saw it, she cried out treason. The soldiers took her out of the temple and she was slain. Joash was personally discipled by Jehoiada until the day that he died. And by that time, Joash was a young man. And, but after Jehoiada died, it says that the elders of Israel came to Joash and persuaded him to allow them to start worshiping idols again. And Joash allowed it. And idolatry took over Judah. And there was a day where Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, cried out against the people of Israel and said, why do you do this? Why do you Worship these idols. Turn from these idols and turn to God. And it says that Joash had him taken out and slain. This was the son of the high priest who had personally discipled Joash. Now friends, that's an, that's a, an incident where we're not going to see the outcome until eternity, are we? But we know what that outcome is going to be, that there will be somebody in heaven to whom the Lord will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But the others will be thrown into hell because they worshiped idols. He turns the way of the wicked upside down, either in this life or in the life to come. Notice the last thing he says is that he shall reign forever to all generations. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Heaven rules in the affairs of men. Do you remember the children saying a few minutes ago, there was one phrase that stuck out to me because I knew what I was going to be preaching. And it said, sing to the God of eternity. I am so glad that we serve the God of eternity. I'm glad that when I'm dead and gone, my children will still have the same God. 
and their children, if they point them to God, they'll have the same God. Nothing will have changed. Though the world may go even further, God will not have changed. He will still be faithful to those who are faithful to him. He'll be faithful to his word. And to that, we can only say hallelujah. Praise the Lord, which is the way this ends. We can trust him and hope in him. Whatever happens, we can trust him. We can praise him. We can thank him because of who he is. Right now, our nation is one of those who is raging against God. Many of our leaders have thrown out everything. But it's not just our leaders, it's also the people of the United States. But in many cases, it's not just the people of the United States, it is churched people who are throwing all of God's word overboard. And I believe it's a challenge to us. Let's make the Lord promises happy are those or blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Let's trust in God. Let's praise his holy name. Although this psalm ends here, the praise of the Lord does not and should not. It sh it'll ascend forever and ever. And we know right now there are a numberless throng around the throne of God who are praising him because they see his glory. We don't see all of that now. We know it by faith and therefore we need to trust him in those decisions that we make on a daily basis. We need to praise him for what he is doing in our lives. What is he doing in your life? Whether it be a discouraging time for you, a time of trials, what is he doing in your life? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, to those who love him, he's good. The Lord does all things good. And therefore, we need to praise him in all things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can trust our exalted God, our Jehovah, our Yahweh, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, whatever is going on in the lives of these people, I pray that through all of it, they will trust you, that they will respond to it according to your word in praise. May they not fear. May they not fear man. May they not be anxious because they're trusting in you and they're casting all their cares upon you who cares for them. And Lord, you, have, you are the one who said, happy are those who put their trust in the Lord. And we will bless your holy name in faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to page 12. I wanted to sing a song of praise to the Lord. And this is a beautiful hymn. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's all... Stand and sing as we close this morning. <clears throat> Let's sing it with all your being, all right? All the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown.
chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Notice on the last verse he says, Oh, that with yonder sacred throng. What throng is he talking about? We at his feet may fall. He's talking about that throng in heaven. Someday we'll be with them to exalt him with all our being. Let's sing it on the last triumphantly. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and cry. 